Hi, I'm Meryl Marco. And I'm Richard Rosen. And what you're about to see may not be your idea of current events. But it's news to us. Relax your arms. Welcome to News to Us. Where we guarantee you news that you just won't get anywhere else. And with good reason. Because we answer questions that really no one else would even bother to ask. That's right. We don't just report the news because the news reports to us. And we know that what the news knows makes the difference between you and your world. You go along with that? Sure. You were really close to saying something. Thank you. First up in headlines to us tonight, Fuddruckers. Meryl, I don't know about you, but as I've watched the growth of the Fuddruckers chain of restaurants around this country, I've been plagued by a single question. When they chose the name Fuddruckers for this chain of restaurants, what name do you think came in second? A dirty name. A dirty name. You come over with a name like Fuddruckers, what else name can you use? <laughs> well, they didn't know the answer, so we came looking for it here at Fuddruckers' corporate headquarters just outside of Boston, where we spoke to the president, Mr. Bill Baumauer. I've been trying to get the answer to this question for some time now. When they were coming up with the name Fuddruckers, what name came in second? I could have some, uh, I have ideas, but I don't think I should put it on the air. Do you think the second choice rhymed with Ucker? It's, it's, very, it's very hard to answer. Uh, I mean, do you imagine that the second choice contained the syllables Ucker in it somewhere? It's certainly possible. <laughs> I think you let that guy off the hook. I had a plane to catch. Oh, well, that explains it. Well, my top story tonight, those spikes at the entrances to parking lots and rental car lots, do they really cause severe tire damage? What do you think? What kind of damage do we have? Severe tire damage. You heard it yourself, it's severe tire damage. Meryl, let's see that actual puncturing of the tires again in slow-mo. Mm, that's not <laughs> Well, finally in Headlines mm. Dust, there was kind of an ugly incident at my house last night. I was standing by the sink in my kitchen reading, and I spilled grape juice on my blouse. I tried to wash it out right away, but it was no use. The blouse was totally ruined. Meryl, I gotta tell you, I think your garment soiling coverage continues to be the best in the business. It is very good. I mean it. It's a good report. Thank you. But that actor didn't look very much like you. Well, you never saw me at home without my makeup on. Is that it? Yeah, I'm no. a vixen. Now, Meryl, you know, there's an environmental threat that affects me deeply, and yet it goes virtually unreported. How could anything that matters to you deeply be unreported? That was my question. Anyway, tonight my special Me Team report focuses on this environmental threat, and it's one of horrifying proportions. <laughs> Unlike many of the more publicized threats to our environment, this one affects us daily and visibly, and yet no one seems to want to do anything about it. I'm speaking, of course, about stray hairs. Earlier in this century, Americans routinely accepted a certain amount of free-floating hair in their lives. But America's population has doubled in the last 70 years, and with it, the amount of hair that detaches itself from its original source and migrates to other objects. I always tell them to, to keep away the hair from the soap. It's the most <laughs> unpleasant place that you find hair. I'd rather not say. What's the second most unpleasant place that you find hair? This is the regional office of the Environmental Protection Agency in Boston. Shockingly, none of the agency's current brochures makes any mention at all of the stray hair crisis, even though this brochure itself has someone's hair on it. But then government efforts to address this crisis are hampered by a single unanswered question. Whose hair is it? Some people think that you're largely responsible for the stray hair crisis. Uh, uh, but no, uh, no, I kind of stray hairs. I don't know what that means. All right, thanks for your time. Some are pointing fingers at barbershops like this one for the possible illegal dumping of, of hair. What do you do with all the hair you cut here? I put them away. Where do you put it? To the gap shift pail. 
You know, they take it all, the sanitation man. You expect me to believe it's that? Privacy. Yeah, of course, you should believe it. This map clearly shows that by the year 2000, there'll be stray hairs on almost everything in America, with the Northeast and the Great Lakes region expected to be hit hardest. Now, is there anything the government can do about this that they're not doing? No, I don't think they, I don't think the government should be involved. And I think they'll screw up the whole situation. Resulting in more hair everywhere? Probably, probably. National legislation mandating the wearing of hairnets like this one outside the home is urgently needed. Failing that, more drastic measures may become necessary before the end of the decade. How drastic? How about electrolysis on a scale never before imagined? For News to Us, I'm Richard Rosen. Thanks for a great report, Richard. You know, you're one of the few newsmen who can wear a hairnet and not look stupid. Uh, I, maybe you have the height to pull it off is what it is. Well, that's nice to know. I was worried about the light blue. Oh, no, very good. Matches your eyes. We'll be right back. <gasps> I love my little girl. <laughs> She's my first. And you know, when you've got this much love to share, well... <laughs> You're going to want to buy a wide assortment of products. <laughs> Isn't that right? Products. They're for you, because they're all about love. You know, this show has given me an opportunity to interview a man who really helped shape our culture. At least the version of our culture I grew up in. Archie Bell and the Drill? <laughs> no, I speak of an American legend, Mr. Arnold Freed. Uh, my name is Arnold Freed, and my occupation over the last 27, 28 years has been as an inventor of novelty items, joke items. In this unassuming apartment complex lives a man who has contributed so much to life as we know it. Now, what was the first item you thought of? The first one was the Wink-a-Drink liquor pour. Uh -huh. And you have one of those here? I have one right over here. And as I pour the drink, the eye opens up and it says, have an eye opener. Uh -huh. After did, did this that, one sell very big right That of sold it? very well. So I just wanted to come right away back with something else pertaining to drinking. And I came with the On the Rocks glass. Uh -huh. As a glass with real rocks cemented in, it becomes a gimmick on the bar. You came to me, Marilyn, you said, uh, uh, how would you like your drink? I would say, on the rocks. And you bring the glass, and it says on the glass. You said on the rocks, with real rocks. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Many other classic novelty hits followed in succession. The Crooked Deck was a favorite of mine. That was a very big sell. And before you knew it, I invented what I called the Nervous Coffee Cup. Would you mind lifting that, Marilyn? Just take a drink. <laughs> Yep. So you designed this yourself? I, with the help of a design engineer. Uh-huh. Very amusing. The whiskey sandwich there, that was a very big seller. Start your own laugh ride, packed in a paper bag that is hand-stamped whiskey sandwich. Have you ever seen a laugh ride? Oh, I've started them all the time. You have? Now, oh, what absolutely. item starts a laugh riot? The bar stool safety belt uh -huh. that, that I didn't show you. starts a laugh riot? Oh, absolutely. When somebody gets up on a bar stool and they connect up those, the, those straps so they don't fall off, it's a pretty funny thing. It starts and, an actual laugh riot. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Now, if Alexander Graham Bell had the telephone, and uh, Ben Franklin had, uh, what did he have? He had the... Ben Franklin had a stove and a, a few stove, other things. A stove, right. And for you, what do we have here? This is... The... Oh, we have here the Wee Wee Fireman. Right. Now, this is a little fire boy here with a mm -hmm. fire hat. Right. And he's holding his little thing there. Mm -hmm. And when I put and this... And by his little thing, you mean... His, his little, little penis. Mm -hmm. And when I take the cigarette mm -hmm. and I put it into the channel over here, and that little boy will just do what you saw there mm -hmm. and put out the cigarette. Mm -hmm. So how, what, what sort of a team of, of uh, people worked together to pull, pull off the, the, what was this called again? The Wee Wee Farm. Right. Oh, it's a lot of work. And so we salute another American legend, Arnold Freed, a man who has given us so much. Arnold, do you remember where you were when you thought of, what's the name of this invention again? Oh, God, the Wee Wee Farm. I remember where I was 
when Kennedy died, I remember where I was when Roosevelt died, but where I was when I thought of the wee wee farming, who the hell knows? You know, I see something like that, it almost makes me wish that I were a smoker. Makes me wish I were a fireman. Makes me wish you were a fireman, too. You know, your graphic is here. Oh, shit. Weren't you with the Moscow Ballet for a time? Six months. Now it's time for my special report on sauces. Wait, it's... I thought we agreed that we weren't going to do a special you know report on sauces, but we talked about I this before, and I said that like we weren't... Air it. No one cares about sauces. Meryl, apparently you're unaware of the special news dust poll I conducted recently. <laughs> apparently I am, yeah. Apparently. Uh -huh. What issue or area of interest would you like most to hear more about on the television news? I'd like to hear more about sauces on the television news. Sauces. Of all the industrialized nations, America seems to know the least about sauces. Anything we can learn about them will uh, help make us uh, more competitive. Meryl, as you can see, you're the only person in America who already knows enough about sauces. Uh-huh, yeah. May I go ahead, then? Mm -hmm. Do I have a choice? No. Sauces. A special report. A poet once said that a good sauce is clothing for food. Sauce. Hot or cold. Sweet or pungent. There's nothing like sauce to dress up a meal. Tasty lip-smacking sauce. With a special close-up on sauces, I'm Richard Rosen. Meryl? That was it? Well, how much more do you need to know about sauces? Honestly, Meryl, you know you're getting very hard to please. In that case, good piece. Nice job. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> Thank you. You know what? Summer is almost over and we didn't have a chance to do a beach piece yet, so I took our News to Us cameras out to Malibu, California to get the real story. I wish I hadn't. I'm here at the beach in Malibu, California, and you know, from where I stand, summer still looks like fun in the sun to these beachgoers. <laughs> the beach, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like the beach to help you beat the heat. Get out and tan your troubles away. Because no matter what your pleasure, the beach still offers something new under the sun. Are you having a good time? Yeah! What do you like best about the beach? Volleyball, guys. The sun, and guys. If you go to the beach, you have to go in the water. The water and the sun. Well, there's no getting around it. Summer fun is still a day at the beach. Meryl. That was really an irritating piece of fluff. I guess that means a lot coming from you, Mr. Sauces. Well, I had a feeling you weren't going to be able to handle it, so I went ahead and did my own piece on summer. You mean you went to the beach? Summer. It presents a variety of hazards that can make traditional fun activities a calculated risk. And what's the most terrifying place of all? The beach. There's nothing like it. Water pollution, disease-carrying insects, beach erosion, and the depletion of the ozone layer all make sunbathing a perilous and ultimately pernicious leisure pursuit. Aren't you afraid of getting skin cancer? Yeah! What makes you feel most vulnerable? The water and the sun. If you go to the beach, you have to go in the water. Volleyball, guys. The sun, and guys. So take a tip from me. Summer may be a day at the beach, but it's your funeral. For news to us, I'm Richard Rosen. I don't believe it. You just took my footage. You took my sound bites. You didn't even go to the beach. You just took all my piece and manipulated it to make it say what you wanted to say. Well, that's what television news is, isn't it? Really? We'll be right back. You know something? Yeah. This is good coffee. Very good. Well, what do you think these four objects have in common? Well, Doc! Whoa, whoa. Wait, hold on, hold on. Whoa. Oh, my God! It was, it, was a gra it was a graphic that said crisis in our schools, and I don't know where it came from. 
That wasn't one of our segments. No, no, I think, I think it's okay now. Go ahead. You all right? Go ahead. Continue? Yeah. Well, what do you think these four objects have in common? They have slobber all over them. Yeah, but more importantly, they all four of them were just recently under my dining room table. Whether you know it or not, I happen to be one of America's top consumers of dog toys. So when I heard there was a big pet supply convention in town, I thought it was a perfect opportunity to get the answers to a few important questions. I'm here at the Long Beach Convention Center for the Western World Pet Supply Association Convention. I've got my dog Stan with me, and I'm wearing a black dress so you can see the amount of pet hair I attract. Welcome to a gigantic gathering of salespeople pushing brand new products, guaranteed to make this a happier world for your pet. Smoofy's the latest thing in pet toys. It took England by storm. It's done over there, and what it is, it's a dog toy. It's like a designer sock. Let me see Stan play with it. Here, Stan. Come on, play with your Smoofy. Stanny, it took England by storm. <laughs> Stanny. But the thing that is always amazing is the incredible amount of detailed thought and logic that goes into the concepts behind the creations. Now, is the Halloween item new for the dog this year? Uh, yes, it is. We've had Christmas items in the past, and now what we're finding is there's more themes available, such as Halloween, Christmas, and the other holidays is Easter, too. Well, why, really, are there Easter items? Uh, more for cats. <laughs> Let's try Stan a little festive headwear. We'll try and convert him into Santa's helper with the rain dog. Okay, Stan, are you ready to become one of Santa's helpers? The dogs love the holidays, the attention. I think he says he feels like a fool. Also making its presence felt in a big way this year is a new wrinkle in the tradition of squeaking food items. Once dominated by squeaking fatty meats like hot dogs and pork chops, now we see a brand new era of healthful low cholesterol and high fiber squeaking foods. We have the three varieties of the of uh, French bread. Now tell me about those two breads there. Those are pretty These amazing. Are European style uh, rye bread. European style squeaking European. rye. Why do you suppose it took the dog so long to get into the finer baked goods? Well, it took everyone a little while to get into the finer baked goods. Uh -huh. Why do the squeaking breads items have no faces, but all the fruits and vegetables have faces? That's a very good question. You could get, like, it would be very difficult to put a face on this and keep the fact that it was a bread. And certain things just lend themselves to being a comic. Other things lend themselves to being realistic. And you feel the fruits and the vegetables are more humorous than the breads? Uh, definitely. They're all going very well. The really? dogs love every single one of them. Really? And so we say goodbye to the wacky world of pet supplies, taking with us pretty much all the items that Stan seemed really interested in. For News to Us and for Stan, I'm Meryl Marco. Tonight, in our segment, Sign of the Times, we take a look... I thought we agreed to change the name of the segment because Sign of the Times is such a cliché. Yeah, well, you know, I found out it's an FCC regulation that every show has to have one segment called Sign of the Times. Oh, really? I didn't know that, did oh, you? No, no, I didn't know that. Anyway, Meryl, as you know, in some inner city neighborhoods... You know, you look nice been, in your little hat. Thank you. Kids have been beating up and even killing other kids to get their expensive basketball sneakers. <laughs> it's a deplorable situation, but now there seems to be a solution. Some inner city youths are wearing a new shoe developed by WedTech called the Ratchet. It has no cushioning, no support. In fact, oh. it barely conforms to the shape of the human foot. Jeez. A shoe so ugly, it affords its wearer total protection from the envy of others. How do they feel? Great. I could hardly stand in them. But other than that, you're not experiencing any problems? No. I mean, nobody wants nothing to do with me. I'm perfectly safe in these shoes. Are you worried about doing permanent damage to your feet? I may have to have surgery, but I'm not getting any hassle from the kids. That's good to know. Thank you. Every kid has the right to enjoy a carefree childhood. And a shoe called the WedTech Ratchet, well, it's bringing that dream just a little bit closer. For news to us, I'm Richard Rosen. 
You know, Meryl, there seems to be a strong prejudice in most newscasts in favor of big stories involving a lot of people. Now, I've never understood that. Uh, most newscasts won't even cover a story of intense personal interest to, like, one person. So we thought we'd pick up the slack. We put this ad in the paper asking people to tell us stories that really would be of no interest to any news show but this one. How was the response? It's great. We were inundated. We got almost six. Five. Round there, yeah. So here to tell us his story is home viewer Jack Birkin. Thank you, Meryl. My story started on a Thursday afternoon in Universal City, California. I was at the movies and I got hungry. So there was a line and everything, but I figured I still had time to get something to eat. Then I hear some kid yell out, the movie's starting. By this time, I'd ordered the hot dog, even though now I was basically thinking, forget it. But I had the money out and everything, so I thought, well, OK, I'll just get the hot dog since I'm already here and everything. So it wasn't the counter. And as I grabbed it, my body also turned fast to walk back to the theater. When I looked down, the hot dog was gone. It was a jumbo dog, too. What had happened was it flew through the air at an enormous speed, like an airplane, and landed at the entrance of the theater, which was about 30 feet away. No kidding, 30 feet. I decided just to ignore the whole thing. So I took the empty bun and ran back to the theater to see the movie. Jack, that was really interesting. I have just a question for you. How was that bun by itself? Pretty good, just a little dry. You gotta try some sauce on that. Why did we do his story? <laughs> of the various ones, it was the cheapest one to reenact. Only on News to Us. We'll be right back. Meryl, do you ever wonder where you're going to be in 30 years? Mm -mm, I'm fully booked. Well, you know, the passage of time takes its toll on everyone. In that spirit, I'd like to take a fond look at some of the greats of the entertainment past and find out where are they now. Known as fast-talking Benny Malkin, he lit up the screen in 1949 with his portrayal of a witty butler in May I Get You Something. He left behind a legacy of laughter. Today, he's dead. Famous for the huge wad of gum she chewed in her wacky films of the 50s, May Weebling also left behind a legacy of laughter. Today, she's dead. Marshall Kramer. His face was the boy next door, but his talent was out of this world. He too left behind a legacy of laughter. Today, he's dead. Meryl? It's weird how they all wound up doing the same thing, huh? Well, I'm pretty excited about our next piece. Guest correspondent Harry Shearer is a man who has a lot of talents. Here, He's like a writer, a director, or a performer. He has a radio show. He has a newspaper column. Hello, Meryl. He's a, a man who can always be counted on to bring back a unique story with a unique perspective. Hi, Harry. Hi, Harry. Can I just start? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go on. Meryl and Richard, I'm standing, well, actually, now I'm walking along the beach here at Malibu, California, where even though the sun is set and night is falling, the gentle pounding of the surf is echoing in our ears, and you can just hear that. Harry? Yeah, what? Harry, have you seen any of yeah, our Meryl? show so far? Harry, have you seen any of our show so far? No, I, I don't get HBO. I figure if I want to see Howie Mandel, I can rent. So. Mm. Mm. Yeah, go ahead. Just no. go on? Yeah, go ahead. Go on. Should I just go on? Yeah. Yeah, go on. Okay. Um, night is about to fall and we can hear the gentle pounding of the surf, but in my mind's eye, I can see the, the daytime revelers who have defied almost certain death to make the beach their summertime home. The beach, there's nothing like it. Uh, we have to take a break now. We'll be back in a minute. That. Did you give him the footage? No, but I don't know what's going on around here. It's okay if I steal your footage, but they have just a correspondent. That is my... He doesn't have the status to do that. That's my footage.
day or night, summer is a day at the beach. Or it's your funeral. Meryl? Richard? Great, great piece, Harry. Thank you. Well, when we began the show, we decided that wait. we were each going to get roughly wait? the same amount of airtime, which seemed only fair to me. As you can see by this chart, we're now at that point in the show. Although Richard has had more segments, I've said more in each of my segments. Well, that's arguable. Anyway, we thought it was only fair at this point in the show that we do a piece together. Where we would each play an equally important pivotal role. I thought I was going to get to say pivotal. I thought I was going to get to say where we would play. You thanked Harry. Well, you got to interview Arthur Freed. Now that you've got, gotten to know us a little bit better, if you were watching a show and we'd each done an equal amount, say, who would you want to see just a little bit more with? I like this suit. I, it's a very nice suit. Thank you. Nice tie, jacket. There's nothing wrong with my suit, is there? No, you could use a little ironing, but it's okay. Which one of us do you actually like better? <laughs> I can't say. Her. You're a little more outgoing. Thank you. Thank What's you, the I... problem with me? You're a little more stiffer. You're like my husband. What did I do to alienate you? I don't know. It's just the, you know, bad karma, I guess. Hmm. Leave but this maybe, woman alone. Maybe Leave her. Hasn't, she, hasn't she suffered enough? Whereas Meryl has probably shown you everything she has to offer as a person just in these few minutes. I'm sort of like an iceberg. You've just seen a little bit of me, and there's a lot submerged beneath the surface. There's a lot of me beneath the surface, too. Much less than I have submerged beneath my surface. Don't you agree? News to us. This has been the news. This has been news to us. This has been the news. This has been news to us. This has been the news. This has been the news to us. This has been the news. This has been the news to us. This has been the news. This has been the news.